The scripture reading this morning, which will be done in unison, is from Matthew 14, 22 to 33. Let us begin. Immediately, he made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up to the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But by this time, the boat, battered by the waves, was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning, he came walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened, and he began sinking. Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Got out to the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshiped him, saying, truly, you are the Son of God. Are there little ones hidden? That I don't see? Okay, I was gonna tell the kids a joke, which is an old joke. But uh, the new pastor comes to town, and so uh, the local, you know, the rabbi, priest, invite him to go fishing. And they're out in the boat, and the rabbi says, oh, shoot, I forgot, I forgot my, you know, my tackle box. So he gets up out of the boat, and he walks across the water, and he gets his tackle box and comes back and hops in the boat. And the new, the new guy's like, oh, my gosh. Then the priest goes, shoot, I forgot my water. Gets up out of the boat, walks across the water, gets it, comes back in and sits. And, and the, the new pastor sits there and goes, huh, well, if they can do it, I can do it. And he said, you know, I, I, I forgot my worms. And he gets up, gets out of the boat, and immediately sinks. And then the rabbi and the priest look at each other and said, Maybe we should have told them where the rocks are. Our second scripture lesson comes from Romans chapter 10, verses 5 through 15, although I'll be focusing on the, go- on the gospel passage this morning. Moses writes concerning the righteousness that comes from the law that the person who does these things will live by them. But the righteousness that comes from faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you on your lips and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For one believes with the heart and so is justified, and one confesses with the mouth and so is saved. The scripture says no one who believes in him will be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all and is generous to all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. But how are they to call on one in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in one of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone to proclaim him? And how are they to proclaim him unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And let us join our hearts in prayer. Gracious God, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts might be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So a little more humor this morning. I, I read over the years different humorous job descriptions for the perfect pastor. So I found one by Dr. Raymond Osborne from a blog he wrote in 2006. 
I edited it a little bit, but it's pretty, it's pretty faithful to the original. The perfect pastor preaches exactly 12 to 13 minutes. He condemns sin roundly, but never hurts anyone's feelings. The perfect pastor makes $40 a week, wears good clothes, drives a good car, buys good books, and donates $30 a week to the church. He's 29 years old and has 40 years experience. He never forgets a name and spends most of his time praying to God. He also knows when someone is sick and needs visitation, even without anyone telling him about it. That one is spot on. He works from 8 a.m. until midnight, but he makes time for his family, and the perfect pastor has no problem with you dropping in unexpectedly. He also spends most of his time in preparation to speak the word of God. He remembers everyone's birth date and, of course, their anniversary dates as well. The perfect pastor, this goes on and on, right? The perfect pastor eats nutritiously, gets his rest, exercises daily, and is always there to listen to you night and day. The perfect pastor has a burning desire to work with teenagers, and he spends most of his time with the senior citizens. He smiles all the time with a straight face because he has a sense of humor that keeps him seriously dedicated to his church. He makes 15 home visits a day and is always in the office to be handy when needed. The perfect pastor always has time for church council and all its committees, never misses a meeting of any church organization, and is always busy evangelizing the unchurched. He meets with all the other pastors in town because they all have so much time on their hands, and he attends all the town meetings for PR's sake. The perfect pastor takes family vacations and attends all the latest church and minister conferences and, and I love this, listens to your favorite TV preachers and is completely up to date on each prominent TV preacher's messages. He spends all day each Saturday preparing the Sunday sermon and he focuses on his family too. The perfect pastor is always in the next church over. Now, if your pastor does not measure up, simply send this notice to six other churches that are tired of their pastor, too. Then bundle up your pastor and send him to the church at the top of the list. If everyone cooperates, in one week you will receive 1,643 pastors. One of them should be perfect. Have faith in this letter. One church broke the chain. Broke the chain. It's a chain letter. One church broke the chain and got its old pastor back in less than three months. The clergy shorthand for this joke is when you see an unrealistic job description, you say, well, in the interview, did they ask you whether you walked on water? Our scripture passage is about Jesus walking on water. I think this is something to think about, especially since we're... uh, we just elected a pastoral nominating committee who are going to be trained here on August 30th by our presbytery co-leader and our COM liaison. But for us to be in prayer for the pastor who you will be calling, we are all a mix of strengths and weaknesses. We all worship God. We all follow Jesus Christ, but none of us walks on water. That's the interpretation of Professor Mike, Mark Vitalis, who has a different interpretation of, of this passage than I have ever heard, and I think it's really interesting. It is only in the Gospel of Matthew that Peter asks Jesus to walk on water. Last week we had a, the only miracle that is found in all four Gospels, which was the feeding of the 5,000, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. This, Jesus walking in, on water, is only found in three of the Gospels, which normally you would think would be Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the synoptic Gospels, which means they had, synoptic means to see with one eye. We believe that Mark was written first and that the authors of Matthew and Luke had Mark open in front of them when they wrote their Gospels because it, of the similarities, but they also had other material that is common to both of them that are not in Mark, and then, of course, their own unique material, which is based on the uh, oral traditions of the communities that they lived in. But what's interesting about this story is that it doesn't happen in Luke, it happens in John. 
but and in all three of the instances where it's written, it comes right after the feeding of the 5,000. So very interesting. It would be interesting, I, I thought, well, it'd be nice, it might be interesting to delve into why Luke didn't include it, but I, I, didn't, I didn't go there. I decided against it. So again, in Matthew, this is the only version where Peter calls out to Jesus, if it is you, call to me to come to you to walk on water. And Jesus says, come. Professor Vitalis reads Peter's request as a challenge. Every other time in scripture when somebody asks Jesus for a sign, it's a negative thing. Like the, the, Satan does it in the wilderness. Well, if you, are, you know, if you are the son of God, then do this. If you are the son of God, then do this. Or the Pharisees are asking for the sign. So in every other instance, it's a negative thing. Why wouldn't it be so here? Of course, the traditional interpretation of Peter is to commend him for his faith, for that he's willing to get out of the boat and try to walk on water. I'm not willing to give that up uh, completely, but I think there's interesting points in, in Professor Vitalis's interpretation. He says, it is not our job to walk on water. It is our job to stay in the boat and make sure that Jesus is in the boat with us. Boat imagery in early Christendom was akin to talking about the church. So it's our job not to walk on water, but to make sure Jesus is in the church. Which, by the way, is what, in, what happens in the other Gospels is in one of them, Jesus gets right into the boat, and, then the, and in the other it says that the disciples requested that Jesus get into the boat with them. Vitalis says that's what's important. You know, just think about, you know, when somebody gets a big head, where they start believing, you, know, uh, you think of the, like the, some of the church evangelists or the, the, the television preachers or things, you know, when they start believing their own publicity and then there are some awful things that happen and this, this, they fall off the pedestal the, in, in shame and you know, we could use a different metaphor, like they sank in the water, right? Because they forgot who the focus is. The focus is Jesus and not themselves. The same applies to us. What's ironic about this interpretation is that for, there used to be a book and a saying, you know, if you want to walk on water, you got to get out of the boat. It was very popular many years ago. And, of course, the encouragement is that in faith, to step out in faith, that that's what we are called to do. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, as quoted by Charles Kuzar, writes, Peter had to leave the ship and risk his life on the sea in order to learn both his own weakness and the almighty power of his Lord. If Peter had not taken the risk, he would never have learned the meaning of faith. The road of to faith passes through obedience to the call of Jesus. Unless a definitive step is demanded, the call vanishes in thin air, and if people imagine that they can follow Jesus without taking this step, they are deluding themselves like fanatics. In The Costs of Discipleship, written by Bonhoeffer, he goes on to say, faith is only real where there is obedience, never without it. And faith only becomes faith in the act of obedience. It's how our faith grows. It's by stepping out in faith, seeing God show up or seeing God bless whatever it is that you have stepped out in faith to do that helps us grow in faith. And we, you, know, you will find yourself standing back and going, oh my gosh, we truly worship the living God. And that is the transition that happens for the disciples in this passage. Earlier in the gospel, Jesus has uh, calmed the, the storm in the boat. And they thought to themselves, who is this man that, can, you know, that even the elements listen to him? But in this story, it says they worshiped him because they recognized his divinity. Peter learned to keep his focus on Jesus, to ask for help, to take his hand. If we make sure that, that Jesus is our focus, we will also be well served.
inviting him into the boat, which I interpret as praying, 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 inviting God into everything that we say, everything that we do, asking for discernment, and then stepping out in faith. My mom, my parents used to help with these religious weekends when I was a kid. It's, uh, there was one called Tres Dias that they were part of. I was in a former church, the, the Methodist church has something called Emmaus Weekends. I don't know if you've heard of those, but it's a religious weekend to, to it's kind of like an introduction to Christianity. And my parents were involved in a lot of those. And my mom said the best ones were the ones where the director of those weekends was really into prayer and made sure that every, that, that prayer was you know, uh, imperative to everything that they did. And I have tried to model that in ministry and, and to be mindful that it's, you know, if God doesn't show up, we got nothing. One of the temptations for many folks is to ask God to bless our ideas. <laughs> we do all the planning and then ask God to bless it versus asking, doing the discernment piece which is what we have done as a church, and say, God, what is it that you are calling us to? Even if we're afraid of it, what are you calling us to? And when I work with churches, I said, you know, your, your, your vision down the road should be something that God has to show up in order for it to make it, to make it come to be, for it to come to fruition. That's how we grow in faith. So our temptation is to ask God to bless our plans, but when we really should be asking God where to steer the boat, that's the discernment piece. And then following the instructions once we've discerned where God is calling us. And there will be winds and there will be waves and we will call out to God and God will, it, I don't know if you notice how many times Jesus, it's, where it says immediately and immediately Jesus reaches out his hand to Peter and lifts him up and puts him back in the boat. We need to remind ourselves that at the very end of this gospel, we have Matthew saying, having Jesus say, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. He gives them the great commission, and it ends with this, and remember, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. In the gospel of Matthew, Jesus' pet name for the disciples are you of little faith. He says it again and again. In the Gospel of Mark, it's, you know, they, don't, they just don't understand. That would be funny. Hi, these are my disciples. They just don't understand. Hi, these are my disciples. Those of little faith. But, you know, it was folks being folks. At the very end of this Gospel, after Jesus has been resurrected and they're given the Great Commission, we read that they worshipped him, but some of them doubted which I've always thought found fascinating. What occurred to me, I think for the first time, it was probably their, his divinity that they doubted. That God was obviously at work through him, but whether he, he was truly divine. And I think that's a question that every Christian wrestles with. For here, earlier in the gospel, in this boat, the disciples are, are, are clear, surely this man is the son of God, right? Years ago, I prayed early on in ministry, God, I know that you are, because your spirit shows up, but I would like conviction about Jesus. So I prayed about it. That very night, I had a nightmare. One of those, like, you like, you like, how did that come out of my psyche nightmares? And I woke up just scared to death. It was so evil. And I did what my mother taught me to do when I was, when I was young. She said, whenever you wake up, she's like, just pray. In the name of Jesus, I cast you out. So I woke up and I was, you know, had this awful, awful dream. And I said, you know, you know, if there's anything evil in this room, I cast you out in the name of Jesus. And instant peace, instantly. And then I remembered what I had prayed earlier. And I, and, you, know, I, you know, I did one of these, okay, we're good. Here we are. I shared that with somebody from my, my former church to the, a, uh, to the significant other of someone who was a, a faithful member who was like, yeah, but that could have been, yeah, yeah, it's faith. It's faith. I believe it was an answer to prayer. God showed up. 
there is power in the name of Jesus. I have a friend who is involved with a healing ministry, and he said that when he prays for people, you have to say in, in the name of Jesus, otherwise nothing. There is power in the name of Jesus. Maybe you have that story of when you stepped out in faith and you were scared and you prayed, Lord, help, and God showed up and knocked your socks off, and, and the next time you hit a scary situation, you're not as scared because you know that God will carry you and see you through. We may not literally walk on water, but there are times when we know that God has carried us or shown through us or made a way out of no way or just made God's presence known in a way that makes faith the sensible choice. And we stay in the boat because we have seen God. I would just like to encourage you, if your stories of faith or answers to prayer, make sure that your loved ones know them. Because it is certainly an invitation into the boat or to stay in the boat. And it is our job as a church to focus on Christ, to focus on Jesus, because without him, we got nothing. In the name of Jesus, may it be so. Amen.